Hello, everyone. This is Tara Alamani of Emerald Lake Books, and welcome to another edition of ELB Live. This is our 14th episode at this point in time, and today we have a guest. This is going to be an episode where we are going to introduce you to our newest author. His name is Bruce Ballister, and Bruce has just released a couple of weeks ago his book called Welcome to the Zipper Club. Now, Bruce already is an author. He writes science fiction, and he has a trilogy that he's written, or at least there's three science fiction books. I assume it's a trilogy. Uh, but Bruce uh, reached out to us for some help with this particular book that he's put together, which is called Welcome to the Zipper Club, Surviving Heart Surgery and Beyond. So we're going to talk a little bit with Bruce today about that book. Hi, Bruce. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I can't seem to make my computer do my camera, but I'm doing well myself. Right now it says audio only, so it looks like you don't have a camera selected at all. Um, I'm just trying to see if that's anything I can help with on my side, but it doesn't look like it. So we will just go this way. What I'm going to do instead is I will upload your picture to have as one of the assets, not uh, so at least they can see see what you look like. All right. So tell us a bit about you. How did you get into writing? Uh, well, I've been doing technical writing all my professional life, but uh, got into start doing short stories about 20 years ago and just, you know, little ideas would bubble up and some of them would turn into print. Most of them got thrown away. Uh, and uh, some of them grew legs and became novels. <laughs> yeah, that's me, it's short for many people. I used to short stories, I think, as practice for uh, how to let dialogue move a storyline along and introduce characters and their backstories. That's interesting. Uh, and so when you started writing, how long ago did you put your first book out? Uh, I believe it was 2013. That was Dreamland Diaries. Uh, that was a book that started with a simple concept for a short story and it got much more involved. Don't books have a way of doing that sometimes? <laughs> Well, what I found really fun was, you know, when you really get into it and the creative juices are flowing and the muses are talking, uh, sometimes the characters start guiding what's going on. I'm a seat of the pants writer. And uh, although I have a loose outline of where things are going, I often don't have the final destination in mind until I get in close to the end. So, um, what, so what they, help, I they help the characters help build the story. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that. One of my favorite movies is called The Man Who Invented Christmas, which is about Charles Dickens writing A Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to watch it a week ago again. And it's one of those movies where he talks about the fact that once he gets the character's name, the character appears. And so when he's trying to name Scrooge, he's going through, you know, scrunch and scriggle and trying to come up and all of a sudden he hits Scrooge and... Christopher Plummer appears as, as Scrooge, you know, it's just one of those things that he's in the room and, and starts interacting with Charles Dickens as the author. And it is really neat how the characters can really take over a story. Well, that's cool. <laughs> um, so I know you, that you've written uh, two other science fiction books. Is that right? Uh, yes. Dreamland Diaries has a sequel and I have recently put out this, well, actually this month, this week, um, another one in a different series or a different standalone is uh, Room for Tomorrow, which is a little more uh, climate-based science fiction than pure science fiction. The first one being mostly about uh, a young boy finds, finds an artifact that he doesn't believe is from Earth. And trying to confirm that starts cranking the wheels of plot. And uh, the plot thickens from there. Sounds interesting. So when you wrote uh, Welcome to the Zipper Club, it really was something very, very different for you compared to what you already had out there, right? Much different. Um, as I had mentioned to you earlier, when I first started or had the realization that I was going to be getting um, coronary artery bypass graft or a cabbage, as they call it in the jargon, um, I didn't know what that was. I heard have heard many times about people getting bypasses and multiple bypasses. And I pictured something in the line of the bypass when you're going through construction and you go over here instead of where you should have been. Um, and that the over there is shut off. And I, I didn't realize an, an awful lot. And when I went to look for information about the procedure and 
recovery. I tended to find a bullet list, uh, you know, even the Mayo Clinic or Johns Hopkins, you'd, you'd find a bullet list of what to expect. And I, I'd hoped for, for more than that. Um, certain of the things that the doctor said during the interviews were unsettling, uh, like my morbidity factors. Didn't really understand what morbidity meant, really. Uh, I now know that it means a complication, not chances of death. Uh, and there are a lot more chances of complications than there are of death. But I found that, you know, I didn't know what to expect, you know, coming home, other than they had like three rules, you know, don't lift your arms, don't lift, don't pick up more than 10 pounds and, you know, don't do this and that. And I found there are a lot more things you should not do. You know, you should not reach into a dryer. You should not do anything that puts lateral stress on your chest because your chest is trying to heal. Mm -hmm. um, simple things like in, in the physics of the thing. You know, they, they make a vertical slice in your chest and they make a rectangle out of it. The uh, tissues that have to respond to make that rectangle from the vertical slice stay sore for quite a while. And these are things that, you know, I thought, Gee, you know, she kind of have that uh, as a heads up. Oh, well, yep, that's going to hurt, and that's that's normal. That tissue has been traumatized. Mm -hmm. um, I got the idea for actually doing the book while I was still in the hospital. Um, obviously, wasn't ready to engage it until I could sit in my chair, my easy chair at the house. But um, I think it's probably day two or three home that I started writing notes about the memories that were fresh in my mind from the hospital and my uh, darling wife who has a better memory than I do uh, corrected some of those memories that were a little bit fogged by anesthesia. So I have a pretty good, I, you know, pretty good idea that I've put forth what actually happened to me and what could be expected. Um, and in this book, I present the caveat that, your experiences may vary uh, mm -hmm. a lot. I had the good fortune of having this procedure done before I had a heart attack and having the bejesus scared out of me. Um, I don't think anybody that takes that ride to a hospital in the EMS truck with the pain in the chest is having a good time um, with the faces hovering over you and the oxygen mask on your face and thinking these might be your last moments on earth. Quite a few of those people survive. Many, most of those people survive. Um, but those people have a harder time in surgery than I did and harder time in recovery than I did because while they're having that heart attack and that experience, uh, tissues in their bodies are being starved of oxygen. Those are things I didn't think would be side effects. Oh, you had a heart attack. Why do your lungs hurt? Well, your lungs were starved of oxygen. Um, and so it takes time for those other tissues to heal and those other parts of your body to heal. I think that one of the nurses told me that your lungs and your kidneys are the first ones to be really impacted by reduced oxygen levels. Uh, and then there's the chance of brain damage if it's really severe. So, so I was so lucky. I went in early. I went in mm -hmm. due to the procedures of having... Uh, preventative medicine examinations once a year and honest discussions with my medical uh, professionals and going through the testing that said, oh, your heart is not working. Your heart has only got about 20%. Uh, the left ventricle only has about 20% of the blood supply it should get. And that really opened my eyes. So once you started writing during your recovery, did you find that it was uh, easy sailing in terms of writing because you were just chronicling a timeline or did you have a hard time figuring out, you know, kind of what to write about when? No, I actually had to remember to simplify and be more concise because I didn't want this to be a long book. I mean, as, as we've, developed it as, as you and, and Mark have developed this book is 80 something, 81 pages long, I think. And I purposefully wanted it to be a fast read because for many people who have gotten the diagnosis or the, the appointment with surgery in three or four days, or five days, you don't want to be uh, given a 200 page book. This book can easily be read in one or two evenings. Um, somebody can find it on Amazon after they get the bad news that you're going in for heart surgery. 
uh, open chest surgery and uh, download the book in a few minutes and read it in the next two nights uh, or a day. It isn't that long a book and it's not that hard. To, I've tried to be uh, personable, you know, personal, um, not sounding too erudite, just keeping it simple, you know, so that it's uh, available to the uh, general public. So what do you hope that readers are going to get out of it when they read it? Some expectation of, yes, there will be pain. Yes, it is manageable. Yes, there will be a recovery process. Respect it. Do what your nurses and doctors tell you. Uh, and, and understand that, you know, as I believe I, I interviewed the, the nurse who was the head of the intensive care units at my hospital. She said, it's all about the patient. You know, you can have a good recovery or a bad one, but it's all on you. Um, you have to do what you're told and understand why you're being told that. Um, you do have to get up. You have to move around. Yes, it hurts to get up and move around. Yes, you're going to be tired. But doing so speeds the process. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it's, it's like pay attention, do what you're told. You know, it's like mom always told you, do what you're told. <laughs> uh, mom's not around anymore. She had a heart attack. Dad's not around anymore. He had a heart attack. As I found, you know, those two facts that both of my parents had heart disease led to my proclivity to much higher uh, HDL content in my bloodstream and more atherosclerosis and my heart condition generally. Mm -hmm. um, and as I get into later in the book, the admonition to the reader that if you keep doing what you were doing, you probably will be there again. That is if you, you know, kept driving through the drive through and getting the triple burger with bacon and, and three cheeses, you know, you're going to be right back in there again at some point in the future. You will only have prepared a uh, damaged engine to have it go bad again. So with your uh, science fiction books, you chose to self-publish, but this one you chose to uh, work with a publisher to, to get out there. Uh, what was your deciding factor in doing that? Um, I knew that it needed more help than just getting out there and waiting for some word of mouth momentum to get going. Um, and frankly, you know, meeting you at a conference last summer, I realized that you were probably at the top of your game. I've, I had met some other publishers who were, you know, pretty much regional local publishers, but didn't have the reach and frankly didn't seem to have the, uh, the connections that you did. And I know this wasn't, you know, random house or penguin talking, uh, but still, you know, at these days, the struggle of an author finding a publisher at the level that he needs or is appropriate uh, is extremely difficult. You know, there's a million new books being written every year. Probably one thousandth of them are getting published. Mm -hmm. So that that connection between writer, publisher, and the public is, you know, there's many different levels of it and many different levels of success. And I hoped to optimize my success by reaching out to a publisher at your level that has a lot of connections. So when it comes, I know we're just getting started with marketing the book because it hasn't even been out two weeks yet, but what do you find to be different about marketing uh, nonfiction rather than fiction? Um, well, that there are people who have a vested interest in the topic. You know, uh, writing science fiction, okay, I know that there's a given percent of the population who still reads that like science fiction. Um, so there's this, this general field out there. Well, I know also that in, in the nonfiction, at least in this particular book's case, there are 800,000 people a year going through open chest surgery, having a, a coronary artery bypass graft. 800,000 is a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. um, and to the extent that many of those are English speaking people and the extent that this book could eventually get translated to serve other populations, that's a whole lot of people who are going through that same apparent, you know, feeling of this could kill me. 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's very it's very humbling. You have a lot of uh, lots of your own mortality and lots of worry about your your livelihood and your family and everything else. And it happens to people a lot younger than I am. I'm I'm seventy. I was sixty nine. Just turned sixty nine when this happened. And it happens to people who are thirty five and have no idea that this is going on. Um, so, for those people who are out there, I wanted to be able to reach them. It's more important than just satisfying somebody's urge to read a new sci fi thriller, have some escapism. Yeah, I know that uh, you know one of the things that that we particularly did was we chose a release date around um, trying to leverage the best time of year for it. And of course, with February being both National Heart Health Month and American Heart Health Month, uh, and those are two different things came about two different ways. Um, you know, and and next week is national patient recovery week or something along those lines oh. and so it's like you know looking up all these different holidays that are heart focused or centric around our health uh, a lot of them are in february and so releasing the book in, in january was something that i know uh we really hoped to be able to leverage as much of that as possible in getting you visibility for the book so if somebody is interested in writing a book what advice do you have for them for a new writer? For fiction or nonfiction? For fiction, um, well, I would say beware of all the rules that say you shouldn't ever do this. For every rule that's out there that a new author should hear, you know, don't use adverbs, don't use this, you know. <laughs> Other than very simple punctuation, write. Write the story you want to write. Uh, I wouldn't worry about you know, I never heard of the word trope until I got into critique groups and people started pontificating about all the things I should or shouldn't do. And for every one of the rules that I heard that I should or shouldn't do, I could name you authors and books that violated that and violated it eloquently. So just write, write your story. Um, and for nonfiction, uh, that depends entirely on the audience and at what level you want to reach them, whether you're reaching them at a professional level um, or for the lay public. So Bruce, thanks for being on today. Do you have any other final words that you'd like to leave people with? Uh, yes. If you know of anybody, um, who is pear shaped as I was, you know, overweight to the point of being clinically obese, there is a good chance that their eating habits are killing them. And yes, they enjoy pork chops and they enjoy french fries and they enjoy occasional cheeseburger, milkshake, all those high fatty foods. They taste wonderful. Ice cream's great. So it's moderation. If you're going to eat those things, uh, do so in moderation. Watch your diet. You know, it's, it's your hunger and your need to satisfy certain urges that are blocking your arteries and will eventually lead to heart disease. Uh, so it's all on, on, all on the user. My, my heart attack, or excuse me, my heart condition was uh, a user uh, error, put it <laughs> in the computer context we all live in nowadays. All right, and so I'd like to encourage everyone who is interested in checking out Bruce's book. You can find it at emeraldlakebooks.com or elbks.com slash AMZ Zipper. This will take you to the Amazon listing, uh, quick and easy. And in the meantime, if you happen to need any help with the books that uh, you are considering writing for your business or brand, uh, we invite you to reach out to us. We'd be happy to uh, have a conversation with you about it. Next week's topic is going to be going through our Dear Reader exercise. Now, this is one of the exercises that we like to use with our authors. It is something that is uh, outlined in my recent book, Published with Purpose. But what we find is this is a very powerful exercise to help writers connect with their readers through the reading process. And so I highly recommend that you tune in and give the exercise a try yourself. And in the meantime, thanks for joining us and following along with Emerald Lake Books Live. Thanks again.